Okay. Well, um, I'm sure we'll still have people joining, but just for to get started on time, um, I'll go ahead and make a couple of um, introductions and then um, pass it along to you. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay and I apologize for the wind and my background. Um, but I just wanted to thank everyone for joining today's presentation and also thank you to the COAT um, group, the Committee on the Environment for hosting and putting together um, today's presentation. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items for, for today's presentation. Um, all of the attendees are muted, um, but you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, we will answer these questions at the end of the presentation. So if you notice on your screen, there's the Q&A button. Um, so please type your questions there. Um, and we ask also because we have three speakers today, um, if you could put the name um, of who you want to address that question to, um, that will make it a little bit easier for us. Um, and then the last thing is um, all of you today um, in attendance will receive AIA CEU credits. Um, so I will take care of that and you should see that posted directly to your transcript. Um, for AIA members or the non-members, you'll get a certificate of completion and you'll have that within a week or so. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over and let the three of you um, introduce yourselves and thank you again for doing this. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Charlie Penland. I'm with Walter B. Moore and Associates. We have with us Rob Rogers with Rogers Partners Architects and Dr. Phil Bedient with Rice University. And we'll talk a little bit more about them as, as we go through this. But we're going to talk to you today about Gaveston Bay Park. Many of you have probably heard a little bit about this. Uh, if you actually go on and, and Google Galveston Bay, uh, a lot of these pictures you'll recognize uh, from some of the things that pop up in there. So we've been very busy trying to get the word out of the project and uh, very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you about it today. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to start off and, and Rob is going to talk to you a little bit about the historical perspective. Uh, because that's an important part about the project and how it works and, and why we're we're doing what we're doing. Then Dr. Bedian's going to talk to you about the storm risk uh, and just what it is, you know, what, what are the reasons for providing something like this when we start talking about how large this project is and then you understand the risk. Uh, Dr. Bedian will go in and tell you a little bit about some of those things. Then uh, Rob and I will finish up talking about the Galveston Bay Park solution, uh, one that protects, restores, and provides recreation. Uh, this project, uh, you know, and all the work that's been done on this project up to date has been by the Speed Center. Uh, who Dr. Bedient is the, uh, um, what are you, the chair or the? Director. Director of the Speed Center, uh, and of course Rice University has led that uh, in cooperation with uh, institutional partners, University of Texas at Austin, uh, Texas A&M Galveston, University of Texas at Arlington, University of Houston, and Louisiana State University, and then among several private partners, Walter P. Moore and Associates and Rogers Partners uh, have played a role in moving this project along. So with that, Rob, you want to tell us a little bit about some of the history here? Yeah, just to <clears throat> sort of set some of the perspective, I don't know how many people are aware of the, the basic history of Galveston and Galveston Bay, but the, the origin story of Houston really starts with the, the hurricane of 1900, which essentially obliterated Galveston, which at the time was one of the leading ports in the United States and in the world. Uh, huge loss of life, uh, massive destruction, uh, really set the stage for Houston beginning to replace Galveston as a port. Go ahead. And the, the 
timeliness of that destruction, which was 1900, mm -hmm. is a sort of uh, historical crux point because 1901 was the discovery of spindle top oil field in Beaumont and really the beginning of Houston as a energy and resource center for the country and for the world. And go ahead. And it was uh, after the, the devastation in Galveston that the founding fathers of Houston uh, put together a public and private partnership and dredged the ship channel from the Galveston Bay Inlet all the way up into the city of Houston and essentially built Houston into the port city as energy and resources were growing at the same time. And again, as a critical crux point in time, next, Right after the ship channel opened, the Panama Canal opened, which means that now Houston has become one of the major world access ports through both the Atlantic and Pacific shipping routes um, and really led the way for Houston to become what it is today. Next. Which is essentially, uh, you know, the center point of energy operations in the United States. Um, depending on how you calculate it, 25 to 30 percent of the petrochemical activity in the United States takes place in and around, completely supported by the Port of Houston uh, and this shipping traffic to all over the world. Um, as, as Javier knows, incredible, powerful resource uh, for Texas itself, uh, for the nation, and so mm -hmm. I think we're really talking about a national perspective in terms of the uh, energy and financial and population resources of the area of Houston, Harris County, uh, and, and throughout Galveston Bay. So Phil's going to talk to you a little bit about the storm risk. Yes, thank you. Um, so for all of you uh, tuning in here today, <clears throat> I don't have to tell you that we live in a in a flood prone uh, area. And in particular, um, you know, this, this started uh, long ago, although more recently uh, we've been uh, hammered and, and impacted by, uh, believe it or not, Katrina. We had a Katrina effect over here and then Rita uh, in, in 05, which, which created a massive and, and one of the largest evacuations in US history only to be followed by Ike in 2008, which helped launch um, a lot of the research that, and, and, and a lot of these ideas that we're presenting today. Um, and it also helped launch the, the Speed Center, which, which formed in 2009. And now, <clears throat> recently, of course, Harvey uh, took a, a massive toll on, on the local area with, with, with extensive rainfall. Started out as a hurricane and became a tropical storm that that truly impacted Houston uh, and, and became the largest storm and, and most damaging uh, flood in U.S. history. Other storms out in, in the area, out in the, in, in the uh, you know, impacting Florida and, and the Puerto Rico included are, are shown here. And then, uh, as I say, it's, 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 uh, it's an area uh, where we live that is extremely prone. And in fact, they're saying this, current season coming up is going to also be a very active season uh, for, for these types of storms. Next slide. Um, this is the iconic <clears throat> photo of the Bolivar Peninsula showing uh, the devastation from about an 18 foot storm surge coming in at, at Bolivar and basically just taking out everything uh, in its path. And you know the, the issue here is how do you defend against this what if, what do you do and, and what can what can you build uh, uh, easily quickly um, and efficiently in order to provide some protection we've learned a lot about these defenses over the years now for, especially from our our interactions and collaborations with the Dutch we literally go and visit the Netherlands uh, almost on an annual basis and have done that since back all the way back to 2008 um, and so they, they have the, they have the plan of, of how to do things. They, they've done it for many, many years. Um, some say a thousand years. 
uh, they've de been defending against the North Sea. And so we've used a lot of their concepts in, in some of our, our planning and some of our ideas. And in addition, we've also learned from uh, New Orleans and uh, what they've done over there. Of course, in addition to just these, these major uh, impacts from surge and, and large wind and, and rain events, we also have the, the double threat of uh, oil spills and, and leakage uh, that occurred. In fact, it was an oil spill uh, during Katrina in New Orleans that gave us the idea to originally start, uh, start up the Speed Center because of the, the impact from a single uh, tank over there. Next slide. <clears throat> so we started in earnest, and, and this is one of the very, very first computer modeling graphics that we actually created. This is, this is uh, way back. And it's taking the original Hurricane Ike from 08, and within a, within a year or two, we were fully operational with these, with these codes and these computer models, uh, thanks to our collaboration with the University of Texas and Dr. Clint Dawson over there, who's one of the premier experts on this. And we ended up just moving uh, the landfall, if we had just moved it uh, just 20 miles down coast on Galveston Island, uh, as shown here, uh, we would have ended up, instead of 12 feet of surge in the ship channel, as Ike brought, uh, and, it, and, it, and of course, it, the original line, as you, as you see here, produced a major surge up on Bolivar of about 18 feet. It's not shown in this slide, what we're showing here is if you slid that hurricane down coast, you end up with 20 to 25, 23 feet or so of surge in the Houston ship channel. If we get that, if we get that level, the, the ship channel is generally protected to about 15 feet. And you can just imagine the floating tanks and the impacts that would result. Next slide. So based on that early work, uh, we also went in and began to do uh, a lot of computer simulation and analysis to try to figure out just what would one of these storms uh, look like. This is sort of a category two type storm uh, coming in. Next slide shows a category three with, with uh, again, this is kind of like Ike, which was 109 mile an hour winds. So you, you crank that up to about 125 and you put it in at, at, that, at that infamous point on, down on Galveston Island. And all of a sudden you start to see some really um, major impacts and you're getting now surge up into the, into the mid twenties uh, in the ship channel, all the way back up into the, into the city of Houston. And this would be of course, all along the west side uh, of Galveston, I'm sorry, all along, west side of Galveston Bay. And the impacts would be just absolutely uh, tremendous. Next slide. And here, uh, even worse is, the, of course, the Category 4, which takes it up into the 130s. This is an official FEMA storm that we were using. Uh, all of these are, are, you know, the more red you see, the more danger, the more risk, uh, the more impact. And it would, it would truly be uh, kind of an off-the-charts event. Next slide. Uh, finally, let's go ahead and consider sea level rise. I think here we're considering sea level rise of about 2.4 feet. And that takes it into the purple zone and we don't even want to talk about that. It, it's, it's really, uh, it, it, it could get as high as 30 feet and, and then some, depending upon the exact strike uh, of, the, of the hurricane. So there's a lot of risk here. Next slide. So, you know, what's at risk? Uh, it, it's, it's just a, a a tremendous area that's at risk, and uh, Charlie, I think this is perhaps the slide where I'm I'm uh, I'm finished. Now you got you got a couple more here. Couple more. This so is what, just to introduce the risk a little bit for you. What's so. at risk? Obviously, it's uh, you know we're talking about risking uh, wildlife habitat. We're talking about risking uh, all of the uh, industry and all of the boating and all of the activities that that are down in that area. The industrial risk is demonstrated here. One of our colleagues here at Rice, Dr. Jamie Paget, in, in, my, in, in our department here in civil engineering, uh, put together an amazing study. And actually, two PhDs resulted out of this study, one from Rice, one from U of H. 
where they look carefully <clears throat> at the impacts on these tanks that are in the area. And you'll see here the top curve uh, or, or graphic map. And of course, red is, is an indication of a very, very large risk. Uh, is, it, is it 15 feet of surge? Uh, so there are a few tanks there. And you can see how that greatly increases by the time you get to 25 feet. And if it goes higher, it's even more. There are something like 4,500 tanks out there now. And these are tanks as, as shown in the figure uh, to the left that, that carry all sorts of products and, and are, are in, in immediate proximity uh, to the ship channel, which is shown there. And you start adding 25 feet of water back up into those areas, and you're gonna get tanks beginning to float. They float just like boats. And that's what happened to Murphy Oil in New Orleans, and it ended up, ended up having to take out 200 homes, um, actually demolish and, and get rid of the homes because of you can't clean a house once it's got crude oil inside of it. Next slide. And again, it's not just the ship channel and all of the industries, but it's also the human risk of all of those thousands and thousands of folks that live over, especially on this side, the, the west side of Galveston Bay, that work and, and uh, you know, and, and commute in and, and work at the, at the industrial sector there. And so many of these folks are impacted equally by these, these huge storms uh, that come in which again is one of the reasons, it's not just the ship channel, but it's also this Western sector that we, we began to early on within the speed center begin to look at ways to defend for this particular type of, of tragedy. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk to you a bit about our solution, the Galveston Bay Park Plan. And the first thing that really is really important for everybody to understand is that through a lot of hard work and uh, uh, collaboration and, and just you know, trying to get everybody in alignment that we actually have a, a stated uh, news release that says that the Galveston Bay Park is compatible with the GLO uh, Univers uh, Corps of Engineers uh, plan. So the fact is, is that uh, this project emphasizes unique aspects of what is trying to be accommodated by uh, the current plan, uh, which is the coastal spine. Um, and so, you know, having this collaboration says that we can work together to come up with a very good uh, plan for all of Galveston Bay. So what are some of the elements of it? Um, the part, the Galveston Bay Park portions are uh, what are up here is one and two. It is a, a barrier that would be constructed along the Houston Ship Channel and raising Texas City levee to 25 feet. Uh, then for the coastal spine portion of it that the Corps of Engineers is working on, there'll be a backside levee around the city of Galveston uh, there'll be a double dune shoreline protection where the existing seawall is not, and then they'll utilize the existing seawall. And then they're talking about a large ship gate uh, at uh, Bolivar Roads uh, between Bolivar Peninsula and Galveston Island. And this just shows you uh, some of the breadth of where this expands from the left from Texas City uh, then you can see where there's sort of hard edges along the ship channel, soft edges on the inside uh, with different openings and it comes back and ties into uh, Baytown. And so what is the impact of this? You see on the right, if we don't have the protection and on the left with Coastal Spine and Galveston Bay Park in place, you can see the huge benefit uh, that these projects uh, have in protecting Galveston Bay in uh, this area. So it starts out, it will be built in phases. And so the very for first portion of this is just the barrier itself. Uh, we're due for another large hurricane, uh, you know, if you look at history. And getting that in place as quickly as we can is, is urgent. So the first part of this project really is just getting this barrier in place. 
Uh, then over time, as we're able to do it, we'll fill in behind it to create the, the recreational and the, the habitat and some of the ecological elements of the plan that will make it more user friendly for everyone. This will start out with existing dredge spoils. Uh, on top of that, we'll get, we place the barrier, then we'll start to create habitat. Uh, vegetation will start to grow and, and aid in the flyover for all the migrating birds. And then the final layer will be the park program. And Rob will tell you a lot about that in a little bit. Uh, as we talked about, the, the amount of trade that comes through this port makes it essential that we get this project done and, and we get it done quickly. Um, the other thing that plays into this is the fact that not only are exports growing from the uh, Port of Houston and, and Galveston area, but we also have the enlarged Panama Canal. So larger and larger ships are coming in. And so it's really necessary to do something with the ship channel. Uh, in talking to the Houston pilots, uh, and, and let me explain the Houston pilots. Houston pilots, they, a regular ship captain will not take his vessel into Galveston Bay. It's way too dangerous. So they have specially trained captains that are flown out to each ship and they pilot those into the Houston ship channel and back uh, because the channel is so narrow. You can see that 530 foot dimension on top. Uh, right now there's an approval to expand it to 700 feet and we'd like to get it out to about 900 feet. But right now the ships actually play chicken. You see the little diagram there. They actually head for each other as they're coming uh, in, you know, to pass each other and then use the wake of the ships to push them aside so they can stay within the channel uh, but be, you know, not hit each other. Very, very dangerous and that's why the the ship captains, you know, the Houston pilots are the ones that are the only ones that know how to do this. Uh, there is a draft environmental impact statement uh, that was issued for the widening of the channel and, and the first project will go ahead before we get started. Um, but the reason for widening the ship channel is obvious. We had this happen, I think about a year ago uh, when one of the barges was hit and emptied all its contents in and actually shut down the ship channel for weeks. So it's, it's a very dangerous situation and does need to be improved. So the current plan will, will dredge out the channel, like I said, to 700 feet. And it has distributed places to put all the dredge spoils. And so one of the largest costs on the land that they have today is to take some of those dredge spoils inland uh, and then in other places and not, you know, it takes it a, a adds cost to the project to pump these dredge spoils along the way. So our plan uh, as they come along and start to widen it even more would be to actually use that material to create our barrier. So this shows you a little diagram where they'll take it, you know, dig out the virgin clays that are over in the widening section and actually build the barrier itself. And then the maintenance dredging over time will create the rest of the, um, the width and the beaches and the other recreational elements that will go on to the barrier. Um, there also will be a bunch of different navigation gates, small craft gates. Right now, if you look at a chart of Galveston Bay, there's several channels that have been cut back and forth so that deep hold ships and, and craft can uh, sail through uh, you know, the bay and get through an area that actually where we're showing the, the barrier is on the original spoil banks of the original ship channel. So in order to have access through there, these areas have been cut through. So those will be maintained as small craft um, uh, gates so that ships can get back and forth across either side of the bay and also will uh, provide for circulation and uh, extreme event floodwaters to get from one side to the other. And then down at the ship channel, there'll be one large main gate uh, that allow the ships to go through. 
Um, Rob, you want to tell us about the rest of the the plan, the pretty part of the plan, I should say? Well, I think it's the, the key thing is that we've talked a little bit uh, about the channel widening, which is an environmental improvement in terms of the, the danger of the shipping lines. It's an economic development project. Um, Phil has pointed out the extraordinary risk of the hurricane surge and how this prevents that. And what the way we like to talk about this is as a really serious piece of 21st century infrastructure that it's it's not just built to do one thing it's built to do a whole bunch of things and so it it manages the ship channel expansion it it provides hurricane risk uh, reduction um, and then we are looking at programming this all as a public park so you're in fact creating new waterfront accessible space almost 10,000 acres uh, to participate in the bay and the soft edges are there for habitat restoration, water quality improvement and ecological benefit. Um, go ahead. When, when we began this exercise to look at it and we started talking about creating public access, it's really interesting to note, uh, given the history of Galveston Bay, there's actually only 500 acres of land that is waterfront and publicly accessible. Um, almost everything is privately owned, managed and maintained. So this really puts an entirely new face in terms of uh, public relationship and access to the Bayfront. Okay. And when we talk about the soft edges, what the black lines indicate are hardened shorelines. So it's either riprap, sheet pile, or seawall. So essentially, all of, the, all of the soft wetlands, marshlands, all those things that provide habitat and healthy water quality uh, have, have been taken away over the years. And so the park actually creates substantial areas, miles and miles and miles of marshland and wetlands back into the bay, super enhancing habitat and water quality. Next. So we've taken a look and there are some of these islands out there now that have been used for dredge spoil over the time. And they are, are living proof that you can actually take this strategy and begin to expand it, invest it, and, and make it perform all these other things that we want it to do. So that when you begin, go ahead, Charlie. So when you begin thinking about what Galveston Bay Park may be like, think about your favorite national park, uh, whether it's bird watching, go ahead, or active recreation in terms of getting into and being on and around the bay uh, with the, every sort of recreational activity that the water provides, go ahead. And we're looking at, at much of the soft edges. Remember, these are areas that we're anticipating inundation. So when you think about horse riding, bike riding, camping facilities, really, it's not like you're building a, a tourist center. You're really building an open park space that is built like the original national marshlands to be able to take this uh, exchanges of water and serious storms. And it means a complete new kind of sets of relationship between all of the residents of the Galveston and Houston region um, and the Bayfront, where this is really a substantial regional park at the scale of a national park, but really uh, a regional park. Go ahead. It also completely changes opportunities for the uh, boating industry within because it provides a whole collection of destinations and we've talked about building marinas uh, that, that can be towed to the backside when you need to close for a storm. So there's a, a whole host of ways in which you're going to be able to activate uh, recreation and access to the bay. Okay. And it means at every scale. It doesn't mean you have to have a giant boat and a little thing, it skiffs, it's pieces. And we think that the opportunity for this to be one of the most 
equitable contributions as a public resource to the region is really significant. Go ahead. Thanks. Go ahead, Charlie. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> and when Phil had mentioned learning from the Dutch, um, and so one of the things that the Dutch do is, is every year they test these major shipping gates and it becomes a massive celebratory time and it's about creating infrastructure that we don't fight with. It's not like fighting the next widest highway, where's it going to go? This is actually infrastructure uh, that serves all these purposes yet becomes a vibrant part of daily and, and year-round life for the entire Houston region. Go ahead. And the last slide is really, you know, I always say when I was a student at Rice University, I hardly knew Galveston Bay was there or about the ship channel. And I think bringing this public access there actually recreates Houston and the entire environment as a coastal city. Uh, where you actually create these levels of protection and opportunity uh, layered together into uh, a remarkable opportunity for the region. Um, and I, we're talking now, um, as we'll take questions shortly, that, that even in this time, post-COVID, when we talk about the economic recovery of Texas and the region, that this is the kind of infrastructure, this is the kind of thinking that we need to bring forward so that we make plans now for a robust, healthy, and safe next hundred years. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. So that concludes, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the presentation of the plan. We're ready to take on any questions um, that anybody might have. There are a couple of questions here. Um, so we have, Jennifer is asking, what is the timeline for this? Um, I guess if there's any of you can answer. <laughs> the timeline. Well, let me start and then uh, Phil, you can jump in. I, we are at this point uh, trying to raise funds to get the next part of the study going. And, and I should point out that this is uh, not intended to be a federal project in and of itself, that we are trying to build this locally so we can control both the time and the quality uh, that goes into it. So this would be done uh, with local funds. So I, I think that's an important part. So we have, uh, some work to do to get our plan uh, on par with where the Corps of Engineers are on the coastal spine. And then, uh, you know, we will need to raise some money to get this started and then go forward. But there's a uh, environmental impact statement that the Corps of Engineers will issue in October. We're hoping to fall under that and start moving the project forward. So Phil, you want to add to that? Yeah, the only, uh, the only time frame that, that I'm aware of that, that we've released about this project, we've always said it's something that's in the three to five year time frame. Once everything is sort of permitted and set and ready to go. Um, so that can take a year or two, obviously. But yeah, it's, it's within a, you know, it's certainly very much within a few year uh, time frame uh, to build a project like this. It's, it's very doable and, and um, it's not a decade and it's not 20 years. It's, it's, it's you know, with, within a, I would say about a five year time frame total, something like that, five to seven years. Okay, next question. Yeah, I so this is for any of you three. How have the residents in the area responded to this? Um, is it positive or is there a fear of change? Um, We've had a bunch of mixed reactions to this, mostly positive, frankly. Um, the, the main fear that we've heard is that, uh, you know, there is a concern that this might 
compete with the Coastal Spine Project, and it does not. And I think that's why I started out with the note of collaboration with JLO and Corps of Engineers, <laughs> is that this project is compatible and can be done in concurrence with the Coastal Spine and does not compete in any way with that project. Um, this has gotten a, a better response, I think, from the, the residents themselves than some of the earlier concepts uh, of the barrier along uh, Bolivar and, and Galveston, where they were talking about some larger walls, and the residents really did not like that idea, and that's why they have switched to dunes uh, as a protection there. But um, I think realistically, everybody we've shown this goes, wow, you know, we really like it. Uh, and then it's just making sure that this doesn't uh, compete with anything else. Well, and, and to add to that, I think there was another question about uh, sort of, you know, with the coastal spine in place, and that has changed through time in that now, based upon what I understand from the Army Corps of Engineers, it's supposed to be designed somewhere between nine and 12 feet as a dune on the beach. Uh, originally, it was it was 17 to to 18 feet, now it's down closer to, to uh, 12 feet as a, as a dune on the beach. And if that's indeed the case, then uh, not only does this project within Bay uh, uh, collaborate with it, but, it, but it's almost a necessity to make sure that we control for residual surge. Uh, obviously we've said that uh, Ike came in at about 18 feet Katrina came in at 27 feet, highest surge ever recorded on the coastline of the United States. Uh, I think we could very easily see surges hit the Houston area that are in between Ike and Katrina. Uh, so we could easily see 20 to 25 foot surges. The coastal spine is going to do its job by helping to knock down a lot of that, a lot of that impact at the coast but that residual surge is gonna come in the bay and that's one reason that a project like this is, is, is a necessity. This is not a new concept at all. This is exactly the concept that is present in and around Amsterdam, in the Netherlands, multiple lines of defense uh, for, for protecting there. So they have, they have a, a defense out at the, at the sea or at the, at the edge and then they have another defense in bay. And, uh, so we're using them as kind of a kind of a guidepost here. Yeah, and I think the other thing is is that uh, in the uh, original plan uh, that the coastal spine has, it really is using uh, some passive protection on the west side of the bay, so that there would be buyouts and and controls that would be further back in to uh, the west side of Harris County. So this would actually add protection to those and not really impact those homes. So there's some added value to this that uh, I think is a, some real interest to the people in that area. Thank you. Um, so we have the next question is, is the plan to widen the ship channel something that's already funded? So the current widening is, is approved uh, and now we have to wait for Congress to uh, appropriate the funds for it, but it is a project that has been approved. Uh, so it's, it's made it uh, almost there. And so now the important part and probably the contentious part is finding the money for it uh, with Congress, but, but it is approved. Uh, this extra widening uh, would add to that and would, would follow on behind uh, the current widening plan. Um, Rob, given your experience with other projects that provide protection and improved resiliency from disasters, I wonder if you might speculate about how funding or financing for the project could work considering a combination of a variety of local, state, and federal sources. And this is from Council Member Robinson. Uh, thank you. Yeah. It's, I, the, the funding and financing actually comes back to what I was talking about in terms of this 21st century infrastructure 
where we're actually performing five or six major tasks with a single project. So you can understand the economic development of getting the ship channel up to 900 feet. It means you've got safe and secure two-way shipping passage all the way through the entire bay. So increased commerce, which means participation from industry. You've got the entire creation of protection, which changes the entire insurance parameters, not only for all of the industries, but for several hundred thousand homes that are now taken out of flood risk situation. So we've talked about uh, forward thinking ways of, of monetizing and securing insurance savings. Um, we've talked about social impact bonds uh, that are there because you're producing the, the recreation and the equity. Um, and then there's the ecological restoration and habitat restoration. So you, you're really looking at uh, an array of funding opportunities and, and building the widest possible constituency because it's one of these places where you've got the captains of industry and you've got the uh, the birders and and everybody is is participating one way or another and I think that that's where the strength of the project lies is in the the diversity and the range of its solutions uh, overall and I think that'll also be the fundamental underpinning of the participation as David suggested at at local state and and perhaps at a federal level as well. Thank you. Um, the next question, if the rumors are true, the Beaumont area is developing a flood control system along their shores. Does that impact any of the proposed ideas downstream for Houston? I was looking at that question. I, the uh, GLO is actually looking at the full coastline of Texas right now and uh, the Beaumont area is one part the Galveston area is another and then down toward Corpus and and south and so they're looking at all of these things they're pretty much independent projects when you go in and look at the different systems they they have divided it up into different regions so Galveston is sort of a region in itself and it really other than than maybe just the competition for funding uh, I don't think that there's really any um, damage impacts, let's say, if one gets built versus the other. Thank you. Um, to what degree can this project mitigate storm surge, even if coastal spine doesn't go forward? We have done uh, a lot of those analyses as well. We've looked at both in place. We've looked at different levels uh, of, of protection and so on and so forth. And Believe it or not, this by itself uh, actually does a tremendous job because it's going to be built to 25 feet. So within Bay, it's going to be protecting to that level. Uh, it doesn't, obviously it doesn't provide the regional protection that the addition of the coastal spine would provide, but it does, it is a significant uh, step in the protection system but I think multiple lines of defense, we've said all along, are really uh, are really necessity here because of the vagaries of Mother Nature. I mean, we, if I can add to that, Phil, the other thing we've talked about is we think this is a potentially faster timeline, and this is the the environmental risk uh, is really here, and so if this can get done quickly. Uh, the coastal spine really comes along, you get the, the belt and the suspenders, those multiple lines, but you get this critical line in place for the largest amount of the population and industry that, to be protected. Yes, yes. Thank you. And this one is for Phil again. Are there any considerations needing to be addressed for the ability of the channel to drain in um, the Houston region? We've looked at that uh, carefully as part of an earlier project where we had the Centennial Gate. Uh, the, the, the interesting thing, and you can look at this graphic that's on the screen right now. You'll notice that the bay, the, in, the, the, the bay that's on the, uh, the, the western side closest to 
uh, Clear Lake. That's actually a very large bay. And so while the surge comes in and, there, and typically surge comes in and goes out in, in, about, in less than a day, all of Ike happened in literally 12 hours. And so as soon as that surge begins to diminish and as soon as things begin to drain out, all of those gates then are opened. And so everything is allowed to drain out uh, in, a, in, a, in, in a fairly reasonable uh, time period. Usually uh, the runoff coming off of the city of Houston will be a two to five day time, time period. The surge is that first day only. And so there's, a, there's plenty of bay here to actually absorb a lot of that runoff uh, in, that, in that first day. And of course there's 25 feet of protection. We'll be running detailed hydraulic analyses of that, um, but, but I'm fairly confident based on everything that I've seen that we're gonna be okay. And we've also looked at water quality uh, along the way. We've done water quality studies, what impacts would this have on salinity and that sort of thing in the bay. And we found in, in no place did we see any change more than uh, a single part per thousand on, on the uh, salinity scale, which is really minimal. For, uh, for any sort of impacts on, uh, on wildlife or fisheries. Okay. Um, it says, if it is funded already, will they move the spools in the location you are suggesting if the, if the project isn't funded? So, you know, the, the process for these projects, uh, you know, when you're out in the bay and you have a large project like this, uh, there's a long-term environmental assessment that's done. And so in doing the current channel widening project, all these other areas had already been designated and the uh, environmental consequences weighed. And so it's already approved to put it in the other places. So the first widening to 700 feet would not uh, go toward any of this except for those existing uh, spoil areas or, or disposal areas that um, exist today that are along our channel, but they would go to the current permitted designated places. Thank you, Charlie. Um, Phil, um, have concerns about water quality inside the barrier been raised since many large ships will traverse those waters along with the existing outfalls along the coast? Very good question, and again, it's something that we have looked at in, in detail. Uh, there, are, there are lots of openings. Uh, you know, these are some suggested areas uh, as shown here for small crafts uh, to kind of cross over the ship channel and go out into the main part of Galveston Bay. So most of the time, of course, this is wide open and there are lots of areas for that, if you will, for, for water quality issues to, um, to dissipate or to or to, uh, to to move out into the into the main part of the bay, we've done uh, salinity and we we've, we've done uh, spills and leak analyses within this smaller bay, and again we have found uh, that the effects are actually uh, quite minimal. It's a much larger bay than than it looks on this figure. Charlie, or I'm sorry, yeah, Charlie, you might go back to one or two figures earlier to show the size of the bay. Okay. That, uh, we're creating uh, to the western side of the parkland. Further back, on just one of the maps. Fine. There we go. No, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, here's a good one. Here's a good one. So you can see uh, why, yes, it's not as big as Galveston Bay. That length right there, I believe, is about 20 feet. Uh, I'm sorry, 20 miles. And it extends out about uh, five or six miles, I believe. And so it's a, it's a good sized bay uh, on the inside uh, with again, a lot of connectors out into uh, the, the main part of Galveston Bay. So. It, it also allows to actually control spills better than the open bay. So that barrier, you know, anything that, that spill within the ship channel itself and inside this barrier uh, could be isolated and controlled and cleaned up a lot better <clears throat> than if it was out in the open bay <clears throat> where the disbursement is much wider cast. And so there's actually a, a positive environmental impact in being able to concentrate 
where that spill is so that it can be cleaned up much faster and easier. That's absolutely true, Charlie. And when we met with the general land office on this very concept, that was one of the very first things that they mentioned to us that they thought that was a very positive benefit because it, it sort of self controls any kind of a big spill that could occur like we had, you know, in the ship channel instead of it just migrating all the way across the entire bay, uh, you have a, you have a control point with access. Thank you. We got a couple of more here. Um, the next question is the impact to the oyster beds in the industry. Um, what do the fishermen or the oystermen think about something? Um, what this project? So we've we've been in conversation with the oyster industry, and and the intent is to actually mitigate any impact to the uh, oyster reefs, uh, and actually uh, add more oyster reefs to uh, the plan than, I mean, you know, in, into the bay than exists today. So where there'll be some impact, the mitigation will replace in multiples uh, what's there today. And, and frankly, some of the oyster reefs are things that we think actually provide a couple of different values from the perspective of this project. One, it does help form a little bit of a barrier in certain uh, storm events, not the, the very, very large ones, but in some. But oysters are uh, very good at cleaning the water. So having these oyster reefs out there in certain places is a big part of the environmental um, elements of what we're trying to do to, to help clean up the bay, because we think this project can go a long ways to actually improving the water quality within the bay. Thank you. Um, I feel a sense of urgency for this project. What can be done to expedite this project and will a com combination of funding, federal, state, and local sources help move this project forward? I'll, I'll, I'll start this one then, Phil, you jump in. I, we need uh, support. We need vocal support. We need support with the elected officials. Um, we need everybody to feel the sense of urgency here uh, in what this can do. And, and there are a lot of people that, uh, you know, the, the local uh, political leaders and, and other leaders that have voiced a lot of support for this, but they want to make sure that that the community is for it. So community support for projects like this is, is hugely important. Uh, as we all know, and we're trying to raise funds locally, uh, you have to feel the urgency locally. So, you know, we need to make sure that everybody understands what this is and the benefits that we're going to get from putting it in place. I would, yeah, I would add to that that we've, we've, you know, we've received a lot of support uh, to date. We're getting ready, hopefully, to have some, uh, some strong support from the, from the Port of Houston uh, in, in the form of, of a, you know, they're, they're taking a vote on it here shortly. Uh, we've got a strong su support letter from the, from the mayor of Houston. We've, we've had good conversations with Harris County. And so I think there's, as well as the jail up, and so I think there's uh, there's lots of support around. We've just got to get this thing, uh, uh, you know, moving forward, and and uh, especially as we get ready to start another hurricane season on June 1st, uh, it will have been then almost uh, 12 years since Hurricane Ike, and we really have not turned a spade of dirt to protect Houston. So it's it's long overdue. Thank you. And so the last one is, re is um, really just a comment instead of a question from Travis. Um, I really appreciate the effort made to bring the soft edges into the plan. It's so very critical to saving the bay from a human wildlife standpoint. Good job by all participants. It's one of those projects that makes me want to cheerlead and get it done. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I'll, I will First point to, to Rob Rogers, your uh, fellow architect, uh, for helping bring the vision. Um, Phil and I have been working on this a long time, and, and our 
our uh, imagination is somewhat limited by our engineering <laughs> background. So uh, having yourself, an Tyler. architect and, and bringing Rob <laughs> into this has really created a vision yes. that I think is extremely important to help everybody realize what this project really can be. And so a lot of kudos to Rob and, and you know, the architectural profession for providing these types of ideas so that we can put in things that do more than just one solution, you know, that it's not just protection, but it's, it's a park, it's restoration of the ecology of the bay. It's, you know, helping with the, um, the bird fly over the migration, great migration of, of bird that come through this area. I mean, it, it just is so good in so many different ways. Uh, and, you know, that's a great kudo to the, the architects of the world and particularly in this case to Rob. And, and I would also uh, like to mention Jim Blackburn and his vision on this and the yes. early, early going and, and the countless number of hours that he has put in and we've all put in, but especially Jim yep. in, in trying to make this project become a reality. He actually has another huge piece of this that we didn't talk about, and that's the coastal exchange. And uh, that's a, a very passive uh, part of the plan that uh, identifies undeveloped properties that are used for farmland and ranch land and, and otherwise undeveloped and uh, puts a, um, an easement over it for ecology credits. And uh, it is, I think going to be very, very successful. I think it's off to a great start, but it's a, it's a great way to preserve some of the coastal wetlands so that they can absorb some of these large storms where it's not as developed today and, and kind of protect uh, for the future. <clears throat> John, I appreciate your comments and I just wanted to add the thing that <clears throat> I think has been most compelling about this and the, the reason I think we've landed with a plan that does so much in so many different ways uh, is that it's been a, a collaboration of a very multidisciplinary team with experts in lots of different fields. And when you bring up Jim, his background, both in engineering, but also, uh, you know, environmental law uh, and, and bringing all of those skill sets together, uh, I think is the thing that, that allows us to be able to talk about something that is really this powerful and this forward looking. All right. Well, thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Rob, Charlie, and Phil. This has been very um, a great presentation, and um, I think I can speak for everybody. So I appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day um, to do this for us. Well, thank you. We appreciate it very much and enjoy doing it. We're honored to do it. We are. Okay. Well, thank you guys. And um, I guess that will conclude this presentation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.